broadly, the global risk environment. Um, I have a confession to make, firstly, uh, that has made me much more acu uh, acutely aware of this, that since I left as editor of the journal in April, um, the company that did the identification of the horse meat, in, initially in the burgers here and then right across Europe, uh, who have labs in Canada, Kansas, Britain and Ireland, asked me if I'd chair it. So it's been a real risk learning experience all of a sudden, uh, and one that I wasn't prepared for in many ways to see how seriously people take risk, but also how the global attitude to risk has changed so fundamentally, and I suppose what challenges that need, means for the company itself. But also from your own point of view, the co-ops, in my view, have become centre stage again. And I think this had its origins in two areas. One was the collapse in milk prices in 2009. Uh, and I think talking to quite a few of co-op members of various levels, there was a realisation, I think, that we were all in this together, and that the demands and needs for a PLC quote were fund fundamentally different from what was very nicely put by our Arla visitor of getting the highest value for our farmers while giving them opportunities for growth. Uh, there is a very real difference in emphasis there. And I think it's this realisation that was probably, and I'm delighted to see Liam Herlihy here in the audience, was fundamentally behind the establishment of the new co-op structure to handle and process milk for Glanby's regional farmers. So, and that left us very clear that if we want real growth in earnings per share per year, it's the PLC structure. Excuse me, Matt. Good, Sorry good for man, no, Paul, thanks very much. If we want maximum farmer well-being, then at least in the dairy context, and I can come on to Julie's thing on the beef in a minute then a co-op structure would seem to be best suited for that. That's the very end, so if you can work to the beginning, thanks. There are a significant number of risks, clearly, in the food business. And we are, by definition, in the international food business. Thanks very much. This is going on here. Yeah, grand. Thanks. The most serious is probably reputational. Once a company's or a person's reputation is seriously impugned, there is no going back. From bitter experience as editor of the journal, I can record the basic fact that if somebody loses a leg or an arm in a factory accident, obviously it's very serious for the person involved. The employer gets sued, but the award is within a very tight range of predetermined figures. If you publish something wrong and you impugn a guy's reputation, the sky is the limit. And also you'll be happy to hear that brief fees to barristers are also much higher in the case of libel and defamation cases than they are in simple ordinary injury, no matter how serious the injury might be. For those in the food industry, specifically, the risk of a quality breakdown in your process are the real. And this can obviously lead to a reputational problem. But the first issue that has to be clarified is how sensitive are your consumers, or of course in the case of babies, their parents. The case of the baby food scandal in China, which has already been referred to, clearly illustrate the point. Local Chinese manufacturers added melanin, a paint thinner to increase the protein content. With a one-child official policy in place, especially in urban areas, the contamination scandal was explosive and fundamentally shifted the entire market towards imported products. And this, in my view, has led this demand for imported products and the growth in milk production has led to the proposed abolition and actual, in a few months' time, of the quotas here in Europe. But there's not much point, there's not much point in sticking with a quota if the old price relationships stood firm. In other words, there's the bottom line is the New Zealand price. And until 2007, it was chugging along at roughly half the European price. Now, if your main competitor is only getting half the price for the product that you're getting, it makes sense to keep them out of the market. If suddenly all the lines co converge, as they did there in 2010 and have stayed converging ever since, then the whole raison d'etre of a quota disappears. 
The other side of this reputational risk coin, of course, is the <coughs> reputational enhancement which it gave to ourselves in Ireland here and in New Zealand. I must admit, in passing, that despite the large sums involved, I still greatly regret that the Irish dairy industry did not collectively buy the Wyeth Pfizer plant in Askeaton when it came up for sale, and instead watched from the sidelines as it was bought by Nestle. But the risk, and indeed the reality in my view of the Nestle purchase, is now presenting a very real risk that Ireland's dairy farmers will, in the main, be high quality commodity producers with the real, real added value going to owners elsewhere. As a food business, we have to ask, what business are we in? If it's high-grade commodity, then as I see it, the dairy board through Kerrygold is one of the few areas where there's a real Irish brand premium. But I think, and here I suppose I'm stepping outside what's politically correct, are you as an industry stifling the development of the Kerrygold brand? But moving on, even during my time as editor, the risks I have seen agribusiness companies exposed to has been unexpectedly wide and extremely serious. One of the key ones, of course, is regulatory or trade changes. The sugar wipeout didn't come because suddenly Irish beet growers didn't want to grow sugar beet. It came because, for the simple reason, that the trading conditions of world sugar, and especially EU sugar imports, changed dramatically. It didn't matter what the problem was, this was the end result. And that was it, as Green Corp pulled out of sugar beet, and Ireland lost a really interesting, significant industry. There are also technological risks, which we should be aware of much more keenly than we are. Very few of you at this stage will remember clearly, from an agricultural point of view, when Ireland joined the EEC. But back then, that red line is the grain, grain production within Europe. And you can see we were importing 25% of our total green needs, of our total grain needs, mainly from America, but also tabioca from the Far East. There was a whole mishmash, and self-sufficiency was but a distant aspiration of the CAP. It was technology during the mid to late 70s and the early 80s that transformed that red line there in 1974 into a colossal surplus of about the same 25% by the late 80s, mid 90s. And this, of course, led to absolutely dramatic reductions in support prices. This was a risk. How exposed are you to technological risks in your business. Or we can have journalistic and reputational risks of a completely different kind. This was a cooperation we did with the IFA. Um, my successor, Justin McCarthy, and the present president, John Bryan, with Kevin Kinsler, went to Brazil and uncovered that the traceability systems that were in place for Europe were of zero significance to Brazilian farmers. There followed a, a presentation to the European Parliament, and Brazil was, in effect, shut out of the European market pretty well until quite recently, and even still the, position, the quality constraints have toughened remarkably. But as well as the technological risk, there is a price risk through technology. And this is the trend of real prices on the Brazilian food market, and these will influence the rest of the world. There's no point in pretending they won't. And we can see that through technology from the Brazilian government, the equivalent of TAGASC, and a concerted effort. Minister, you're welcome. Nice to see you. We can see that the price of food much more than halved in real terms over a 20-year period. This is an enormous breakthrough, but it has the most fundamental effects on agriculture in other places where the technology delivery is not as efficient as in Brazil. And this, of course, is why we must keep an eye on what's happening in research across the world and keep up our own momentum. But then there can be trade disruptions of a very real kind. This was the headline we ran some years ago 
when Larry Goodman was on the point of bankruptcy, but due, it should be said, to strong political connections, he got the Doyle recalled and a whole new financial process put in place that saved the company. Today, it's probably fair to say that he is stronger than ever, but he was there because of credit risks and trading risks in the Middle East. These are the risks that, to some extent, the Dairy Board will shield the smaller of its members from, and the trading system has probably become more sophisticated than that, at least on the dairy side. But it's a risk, again, that we should be a hear of. But directly in your own dairy area, we had the abolition of the, of the district milk boards, which controlled the supply and pricing of liquid milk. The same de deregulation took place in Britain, with broadly even more chaotic results. How much money at this stage is now being earned in liquid milk? Curry, who had a clear strategic intention of increasing its market share in this area, has entirely exited the business. And even the dominant player, Glanbia, in its most recent update, bemoaned the lack of profitability in its Irish consumer food section, of which by far the most important is liquid milk. But what other aspects of your business are subject to regulatory oversight? And how safe is that oversight as a blanket protecting profitability? Certainly the removal of the ban on below cost selling and in the size of supermarkets has affected your businesses, especially for sale in Ireland, but also elsewhere. A giant multinational operator will find it much easier to import competing supplies than a small family operated store. Apart from the fact, of course, that this legislation is destroying many traditional town centres, but that's for another day. Another regulatory shift that received little attention was the change in Germany of the regime that allowed oilseed rate to be converted into biodiesel. This overnight caused major losses for the Irish company NTR, and some of you, through your co-op structures, may well have been investors in that through a side vehicle. But even apart from regulatory shifts in, in environmental surveillance, there can be unexplained, arbitrary, or unofficial decisions. I was visiting one significant dairy processor recently, and it was specified that the effluent treatment for a new facility would have to be a reed bed. In discussing it with them, it seemed to me that the reed bed system was being insisted on purely to see would it work for dairy effluent and the relevant co-op was judged to have the financial strength to bear the cost of the experiment. Ultimately, this had to come out of the farmer's milk check, and in my view, was an outrageous imposition. But it's not only in effluent treatments, but in production standards that can companies such as yours face varying standards, and this is a real risk. For example, so far as I can discover, Ireland is unique in excluding all crops and grass grown with sludge, i.e., that is, sewage effluent from the main metropolitan centres from its quality assurance schemes. This not only applies to beef and dairy products, but also to mal malting barley. And you might have seen in the recent Iagio press release on its malting barley purchasing policy how it was able to give unique assurance to its customers on the traceability of its malting barley from field to glass. Diageo, the makers of Guinnesses, are doing this in association with by far its main supplier, Boat Malt, where to get a contract, now totally changed, each load has to be capable of being traced back to each field. So what will you do, as most of you are in the dairy business, if a major baby food manufacturer finds out that you have been processing milk from crops or grass fertilised with non-approved <coughs> materials? But it's not just regulatory changes, but differing regulatory standards and how they are interpreted by customers is one of the essentials that's facing you as major producers of export material. In general terms, who are your products competing with? In dairy terms, milk produced in the, U in the US with the help of BST seems to be acceptable right across the world. Yet, of course, it's banned in Europe. How do you or your representative bodies want to portray that to your customers? But in the meat end, the dilemmas are much more acute. Hormones are widely used in US beef and pig meat production, 
And despite all the recent hullabaloo about beta agonists in the States, or as it's more commonly called here, angel dust, it is still a fact of meat producing life right across large areas of the world. If found using them in Ireland, and specifically in Ireland, you lose all your single farm payment, plus a potential prison term. I dealt earlier with the price of grain. The fact of surplus is now in Europe. And the key fact, I think, from a grasp farmer's point of view here is that a reduction in the price of grain reduces the real value of our grass. So you're dependent on research and development into grass varieties, management of the grass, and suitable cow type and breeding to maintain competitive advantage. But you want to be careful of official forecasts. With all due respects, whether they come from the Ministerial Department, from the Farmers' Journal, or the OECD.